Welcome to Data Science Interview Questions. My name is Richard Kirshner with the Simply Learn team. That's www.simplylearn.com. Get certified, get ahead. Before we dive in and start going through the questions one at a time, we're going to start with some of the logical kind of concept that enters in a lot of interviews. In this one, you have two buckets, one of three liters and the other of five liters. You're expected to measure exactly four liters. How will you complete the task? And note, you only have the two buckets. You don't have a third bucket or anything like that, just the two buckets. And the object of the question like this is to see how well you are thinking outside the box. In this case, you're in a larger box. You have two buckets. And also the pattern which you go on. And what that means is if you look at the two buckets, and we'll show you their answer in just a second, you have a bucket with three liters and a bucket with five liters. And the first thought is what happens if you go from left to right? So we have a direction. And what happens if you pour the three liters into the five liter bucket? Well, if you pour the three liters into the five liter bucket, you have an empty bucket of three liters. And what's really important here is out thinking outside the box, you realize that you have a five liter bucket that has three liters in it and two empty liters. So you have two additional liters you can fill up. If we continue that process, we can pour from the left to right from the small bucket to the large bucket. You can now measure in two additional liters into the five liter bucket. And three minus two is one. And and you can keep doing that. You can empty the five liter bucket in, pour those three liters in, that one liter in, and then you can pour three liters in. What's cool about these questions as you explore them is you realize there's multiple ways usually to solve them. I went from small bucket to big bucket. The Simply Learn team, their solution that they pulled out was you fill the five liter bucket and empty it into the three liter bucket. Now you're left with two liters in the five liter bucket. So that's great. We can empty the three liter bucket. So now we're going from large to small. Remember we went from small to large. So you can go both either way, but you have to go one way or the other, it turns out. And you can empty the three liter bucket and pour the contents of the five liter bucket in it. So the three liter bucket now has two liters. And if it has two liters, that means it has an empty one liter. And by now you probably have guessed that if you have an, an empty space, you can start using that empty space of one liter as a measuring. So we fill the five liter bucket again and we pour the water in the three liter bucket. It already has the two liters. And so we're only pouring one liter in there and five minus one is four. So interview questions, they break up into all kinds of different patterns. We have logic like this one, which is a lot of fun. We have questions that come up that are more vocabulary. List the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning. Probably one of the fundamental breakdowns in uh, data science. And supervised learning uses known and labeled data as input. Supervised learning has a feedback mechanism. Most commonly used supervised learning algorithms are decision tree, logistic regression, support vector machine. And you should know that those are probably the most common used right now, and there certainly are so many coming out. So that's a very evolving thing, and be aware of a lot of the different algorithms that are out there outside of the deep learning. Because a lot of these work faster on raw data and numbers than they do than a deep neural network would. Unsupervised learning uses unlabeled data as input. Unsupervised learning has no feedback mechanism. Most commonly used unsupervised learning algorithms are k-means, clustering, hierarchical clustering, the a priori log algorithm. And there certainly are more. Um, I'm going to say k-means definitely is at the top of the list, and the hierarchical clustering, those two are used so many times. So really important to understand what those are and how they're used. And most important is understand that supervised learning is you have your data set where you have training data and you have um, all those different pieces moving around, but you, you're able to train it. You know the answers. And unsupervised, we're just grouping things together that look like they go together. How is logistic regression done? Logistic regression measures the relationship between the dependent variable, our label, what we want to predict, and the one or more independent variables, our features by estimating probability using its underlying logistic function, sigmoid. And whenever I draw these charts, I always end up drawing them the right-hand side first because you want to know what your output is. What is you want out of here? And the left-hand side, what do you have going in? So you have your in and out. You can see we have a nice labeled image here to help you remember this. We have our inputs. We have our linear model. We have our probabilities. What are the probabilities of it being a certain way based on these features coming in? The sigmoid function, and it's important to note that the sigmoid function is maybe the most most commonly used, but it's only one of a number of functions that are out there. And the sigmoid function turns our probabilities into a value between 0 and 1, or very close to 0 and very close to 1, between 0.1 and 0.009. And based on that, we generate an answer, in this case, is 0 or 1. How is logistic regression done? So last time we talked about the sigmoid function, generally depending on what your interview and level of math and what expertise you're going in for the market, you'll have to understand that formula of the probability equals 1 over 1 plus e to the negative y. 
and that's e to the base 2. So you have your probability function or your sigmoid function which pushes it. Um, as you can see we have a nice visual of that and it's, that helps a lot to have that visual on the sigmoid function. You definitely should know your y equals m times x plus c, your basic Euclidean geometry of forming a line in the slope plus the um, intercept, the y-intercept. And then you have your natural log and the natural log is to the e as opposed to a base 2 or base 10. So your natural log to the e of the probability over 1 minus a probability equals your m times x plus c, or your Euclidean line. That helps a lot as far as the graphing and understanding the sigmoid function. So we'll just keep pushing on to question number three. Explain the steps in making a decision tree. And I noticed last time we brought up the decision tree in the forest, a lot of questions came up. What is the difference? So let's go through that. When you make a decision tree, you're going to take the entire data set as input. You're going to calculate entropy of the target variable as well as the predictor attributes. I remember entropy is just how k chaotic is it? So if you have like, you know, banana and grapes and oranges, if you're mixing in fruit and that's your data coming in, you have all these different objects that are so separate from each other. And the more they become uniform, the lower the entropy. And we call that information gain. So we gain information on sorting different objects from each other. So you have your entropy, you have to calculate your information gain of all attributes, and then you choose the attribute with the highest information gain as the root node. So if you can separate your group and each group chaos and each group is uh, lowered, whichever split lowers the chaos the most, that's where you split it and that's your root node. At that point you repeat the same procedure on every branch till the decision node of each branch finalized. So understanding that setup is pretty important as far as decision trees. And you can see here we have a nice visual of a decision tree. For example, if you want to build a decision tree to decide whether we should accept or decline a job offer. Since these are interview questions, that's a good one to ask. And just as a tip, you should be pretty aware of the formula for entropy and information gain. So you need to look those up if you don't remember those. And the salary, if it's greater than 50000 no, decline the offer. Yes, it's got a good salary. The commute is greater than an hour. Yes, decline the offer. No. Offers incentives. Yes, accept the offer. No incentives, decline the offer. So we use decision tree pretty much for everything if you want. <laughs> and if you have a decision tree, then you also should understand how do you build a random forest model. And remember that it, a random forest is built up of a number of decision trees. So if you split your data up into a lot of different packages and you do a decision tree in each of those different groups of data, the random forest is bringing all those trees together. So how do you build a random forest model? Randomly select k features from a total of m features, where k is less than m. Among the k features, calculate the node d using the best split point. Split the node into daughter nodes using the best split. Repeat steps two and three steps until leaf nodes are finalized. Build forest by repeating steps one to four for n number times to create n number of trees. So you can see it's got the same build pattern as the tree, but instead you're building a number of different trees, little small trees, so it all have an n leaf node. Random forest has a vote at the end, and whoever gets the most votes wins. That's the answer. How can you avoid overfitting of your model? Very important question in any kind of mathematical, scientific, data science setup. In any of them. There are three main methods to avoid overfitting. And you should really understand overfitting. Overfitting means that your model is only set for a very small amount of data and ignores the bigger picture. Keep the model simple. Take into account fewer variables, thereby removing some of the noise in the training data. Good advice for any programming at all. Use cross-validation techniques, such as k folds cross-validation. Use regularization techniques such as lasso that penalize certain model parameters if they're likely to cause overfitting. And you should also be well aware that your cross-validation techniques, that's like a pre-data, or your lasso and your regularization techniques are usually during the process. So when you're prepping your data, that's when you're going to do a cross-validation, such as like splitting your data into three groups, and you train it on two groups and test it on one, and then switch which two groups you tested on, that kind of thing. So can you solve, oh, another one of these, I love these things. There are nine balls out of which one ball is heavy in weight and the rest are of the same weight. And how many minimum weighings will you find the heavier ball? And when we say weighing, think of a scale where you can put objects on one side and the other and you can see which side is heavier. And you want to minimize that. You want to split the balls up in such a way that you're going to do as few measurements as you can. You will need to perform two weighings. So you can get it down to just two wings. And I always think if there's nine balls, I'm going to divide them into th three groups of three. Place three balls on each side. So you can just randomly pick six of the balls and three on one side, three on the other. 
And if they balance out, both sides are equal, then you know the heavy weight isn't in any of those. So out of the remaining three balls from step one, take two balls and place one ball on each side. A little tricky there, because I always want to put all three. I want to put two on one side and one on the other. But no, just take randomly pick two of those, put one on each side. If they balance out, then the left out ball, the one you didn't measure, will be the heavier one. Otherwise, you'll see it in the balance. You'll see which one's heavier, because you'll take one of the balls down. Now we go to scenario B, where they did not balance out. So now we know which side has a heavier ball in it. And it's just very similar to what we did before. If the balls in step one do not balance out, then take those three balls, that had the heavier side on them, and reproduce step two to find out the heavier ball. Difference between univariate, bivariate, and multivariate analysis. And hopefully, if you know a little Latin, you'll kick in there that you have uni, and you have bi, and you have multi, because the answer is in the words themselves. So the first one, this type of data contains only one variable. So that's the univariate. The purpose of the univariate analysis is to describe the data and find patterns that exist within it. So when you only see one, one variable coming in, in this case we're using height of students, you're limited as far as what you can do with that data. So you can come up and draw different patterns and conclusions from those patterns using the means, the median, the mode, dispersion, range, minimum, maximum. So we're describing the data. So all those words would describe the data, and that's about all you can do with um, data like that. There's no correlation, there's nothing to go beyond that as far as guessing or predicting anything. So we move into bivariate. You know, uni means one, bi means two. Bivariate, this type of data involves two different variables. The analysis of this type of data deals with causes and relationships, and the analysis is done to find out the relationship among the two variables. And this is always a favorite one because everybody loves ice cream in the summer when it's hot, and very few people go for ice cream in the winter when it's really cold, so it's easy to see the correlation in the data. The temperature and ice cream cells in summer season. And you can see here where the temperature goes from 20 to 35, and as the temperature goes up, so does the cells of ice cream. It goes from 2,000, I'm not sure 2,000 or what, so I'm guessing it's a very large chain, because if they're selling 2,000 ice cream cones, and they have a lot of business, good for them. You know, a little vendor on the corner selling 2,000 ice cream cones a day and 3,100 the next day. Here, the relationship is visible from the table that temperature and cells are directly proportional to each other. So the hotter the temperature, we can predict an increase in cells. So the word prediction should come up. So we have description and prediction. When the data involves three or more variables, it is categorized under multivariate. It is similar to bivariate, but contains more than one dependent variable. In this example, another really common one, the data for house price prediction, the patterns can be studied by drawing conclusions using mean, median, and mode, dispersion, or range minimum, maximum, etc. And so you can start describing the data, that's what all that was, and then using that description to guess what the price is going to be. So this is very good if you're in the market and you have already looked at the area and you already know that a two bedroom, zero floor, 900 square foot house is usually runs about 40,000. You can guess what the next one that looks similar to it is. And I'll just throw in another word in there. I don't see very often unless you're really a hardcore data science. We talked about describing the data, descriptive. We talked about predictive. And there's also postscriptive. Postscriptive means we're going to change the variables to try to guess what the outcome is if we change what's going on. So that would be the next step. But that usually doesn't show up unless you're dealing with some really hardcore data science groups. What are the feature selection methods to select the right variables? There are two main methods for feature selection. There's filter methods and wrapper methods. And when you're filtering your, before we discuss the two methods real quick, the best analogy for uh, selecting features is bad data in, bad answer out. So when we're limiting or selecting our features, it's all about cleaning up the data coming in. So it's cleaner and is more representative of what we're trying to predict. Filter method. Filter methods as they come in, we have linear discrimination analysis, ANOVA, chi-squared. Chi-squared is probably the most common one. And these are all part of pre-processing. We're taking out all the outliers, all the things that are, have a difference that is very different from the data we're looking at, the odd ones. And sometimes you take the odd ones out and then you analyze them separately to see why they're odd. But remember your filter methods, you want to pull all that weird stuff out. Wrapper methods, on the other hand, are forward selection, backward selection, recursive feature elimination. And one of the most important things to remember about wrapper methods is they're very labor intensive. You have to have some pretty high-end computers if you're doing a lot of data analysis with the wrapper method. 
And um, just quickly, forward selection means you have all your different features. They're off to the side, and we test just one feature at a time, and we keep adding them in until we get a good fit. Backward is we have all the features, and we start we run a test on that to see how well it does, and then we start removing features to see what works. And recursive, which is the most processing-hungry algorithm out there, goes through and just recursively looks through all the different features and how they pair together. But again, we have filter method and wrapper method, and it's important to understand that we're sorting the data out and finding out which features are going to represent the data the best and which ones are not going to really add any value to our models. All right, let's jump to number eight. In your choice of language, write a program that prints the numbers from 1 to 50. But for multiples of 3, print fizz instead of the number. And for the multiples of 5, print a buzz. For numbers which are multiples of both 3 and 5, print fizz buzz. And this really is testing your knowledge in iterating over data. Very important. My sister who runs at the university, the data science team, is in charge of their department. It's the first question she asks in her interview of anybody who comes in is, how do they iterate through data? <laughs> so if, if you, this question comes up a lot and it's very important you have an understanding. And there's actually a slight error on this code, which I'll point out in just a second. The concept is we have fizz buzz in range, and you have range 51, which in this case goes from 0 to 51. And I'm going to challenge you to see if you can catch the error, and I'll tell you at the end of the code where the error is. What that means is that we're going to go through all the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and we're going to process through this loop. If the remainder of fizzbuzz divided by 3 equals 0 and fizzbuzz divided by 5 also equals 0, then print fizzbuzz. Continue. And else if fizzbuzz divided by 3 equals 0, then print fizz. Print fizz continue. Else if fizzbuzz divided by 5 equals 0, print buzz. Continue and print fizzbuzz. You fit the print the answer. In this case, fizzbuzz is either going to be the number we generated, which is 0, or it'll be the fizzbuzz, fizz, or buzz. Whew. That's a mouthful. Now, if you didn't catch the error in the code, which is always a fun game, find the error, it has to do with the range. And it's important to remember the range here says range to 51. That's 0 to 51, which is, is correct. We want to go to 51 because it stops. It gets to 50 and it stops. So that's 0 to 50. But if you remember, the question asks from 1 to 50. So the range should be 1, 51, not just 51, which does 0 to 51. In this particular script, in Python, you could leave out the continue. But the continue in this script skips the next else if, so it doesn't keep processing it going down. And in a program I mean, a lot of scripts you don't need the continue answer, so it would depend on what script you chose. And there's probably some other ways to do this. It's a lot of fun. And you can see here from the output, we end up with fizz buzz for zero, which shouldn't be there. One, two, fizz, four, buzz, fizz, seven, eight, fizz, buzz, 11, fizz, and so on. Sounds like a drinking game from my college days so long ago, many decades ago. <laughs> you are given a data set consisting of variables having more than 30% missing values. How will you deal with them? Oh, the joy of messy data coming in. Ways to handle missing data values. Data set is huge. We can just simply remove the rows with missing data values. It is the quickest way, i.e. we use the rest of the data to predict the values. You just go in there and say any row of our data that has a um, NA in it, get rid of it. That doesn't work with smaller data. So with smaller data, you start running into problems because you lose a lot of data. And so we can substitute missing values with the mean or average of the rest of the data using Pandas data frame in Python. There's different ways to do this, obviously, in different languages. And even in Python, there's different ways to do this. But in Python, it's real easy. You can do the df.mean, so you get the mean value. So if you set mean equal to that, then you can do a df.fillNA with the mean value. Very easy to do in a Python uh, panda script. And if you're using Python, you should really know pandas and numpy, number Python and pandas data frames. For the given points, how will you calculate the Euclidean distance in Python? So back to our basic algebra from high school, Euclidean distance is the line on the triangle. And so if we're given the points plot 1 equals 1 comma 3, plot 2 equals 2 comma 5, we know that from this we can take the difference of each one of those points, square them, and then take the square root of everything. So the Euclidean distance equals the square root of plot 1, 0, minus plot 2 of 0 squared, plus plot 1 of 1 minus plot 2 of 1 squared. Mouthful there. And you can remember if you have multiple dimensions that go past two dimensions, you could have plot 3 can simply be the distance from plot 1. You only need to do one side of that. Or plot 2, you can do either way. And square that and take the square root of that. Another mind bender. 
how to uh, calculate something, how to figure out the solution to something. What is the angle between the hour and minute hands of a clock when the time is half past six? So you want to kind of imagine that clock where the large hand is pointed down to the 30 and the other hand is going to be right between the 6 and the 7 because it's half past 6. There's actually a couple ways to solve this, but let's take a look and see how they did it. Note a clock is a complete circle having 360 degrees. In one hour, the hour hand covers 360 over 12, so it equals 30 degrees for each hour. In one minute, the minute hand covers 360 degrees over 60 minutes, or 6 degrees per minute. The minute hand has traveled for 30 minutes, so it has covered 30 times 6, which equals 180 degrees. So we know that's 180 degrees from the 12. The hour hand has traveled for 6.5 hours, 6.5, 6.5, so it's covered 6.5 times 30, which equals 195 degrees. The difference between the two will give the angle between the two hands, thus the required angle equals 195 minus 180 equals 15 degrees. And this is a nice way they solved it because you can now punch in any kind of time within reason. The hard part is on the hours, is you have to be able to convert the hours into decimals. Explain dimensionality reduction and list its benefits. Dimension reduction refers to the process of converting a set of data having vast dimensions into data with lesser dimensions, fields, to convey similar information concisely. It helps in data compressing and reducing the storage space. It reduces computation time as less dimensions lead to less computing. It removes redundant features. For example, there's no point in storing a value in two different units, meters and inches. And I certainly run into a lot with this with text analysis. I've been known to run a text analysis over a series of documents ends up with over 1.4 million different features. That's a lot of different words being used. And if you do what they call uh, by connect them, you connect two words together, now you're up to 4.8 million different features and you start having to figure ways to bring that down. What can we get rid of? That kind of thing. So you can see where that can get really high end on processing and learning how to reduce the list dimensions is very important. How will you calculate eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a 3x3 three three matrix? And what they're really looking for here is when you write it out, for the eigen is that you know that you're going to use the lambda. That's the most common one. Obviously, you can use any symbol you want, but lambda is usually what they use. And that you do it down the middle diagonal. And so when you take that matrix and you take the characteristic equation, you end up with the determinant, and that's the minus 2 minus lambda, minus 4, 2, minus 2, 1 minus lambda, 2, 4, 2, 5 minus lambda. And that's what they're looking for, and you know that's equal to 0. So when you're doing a matrix in the eigen setup with the eigenvectors, that's all going to come out equal to 0. And then you can go ahead and write the whole equation out so we can expand the determinant. As you can see right here, the minus 2 minus lambda times, it's a mouthful. I'll leave it up here for a second so you can look at it. When you break it down into the algebraic functions, you end up with minus lambda cubed plus 4 lambda squared plus 27 lambda minus 90 equals 0. So now we have a nice algebraic equation built from the eigenvectors. And always remember you can hit the pause button and you can also send a note. Send a note to Simply Learn if you have more questions on vectors or on this. Definitely have that resource available to you um, or post down in below on the um, YouTube video comments. And so when we calculate the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a 3x3 three three matrix as we continue on down the math of this, and to be honest, I really don't like working with matrices like this. It's important to understand the math behind it, and it's important to know the code just enough so that you're not lost when someone's explaining it or it comes up when I'm working on different data science models. Um, of course, if you're dealing with the high-end math side of it, then you better know this. First is by hit and trial. So you try in different variables to solve for zero, and you can come in here and you'll find that uh, if we put put in the 3 in there, we end up with a 0 at the end, and substitute the 3. Hence, we end up with lambda minus 3 is one of the factors. And you can do the math going out on that, where we have lambda cubed minus 4 lambda squared minus 27 lambda plus 90 equals lambda minus 3 times lambda squared minus lambda minus 30. So eigenvalues based on that one are 3 minus 5 and 6. 
And then from there, we can calculate the eigenvector for lambda equals 3. And you can see here where the matrix, as we write it out, is the minus 5, minus 4, 2, minus 2, minus 2, minus 2, 4, 2, 2. That was from the beginning. Put in the x, y, and z equals 0, 0, 0. And so when we put in those numbers and we calculate them out, we have for x equals 1, we have the minus 5 minus 4y plus 2z equals 0, minus 2 minus 2y plus 2z equals 0. And subtracting the two equations we just had, we get 3 plus 2y equals 0, y equals minus 3 over 2, and z equals minus 1 over 2. That's going back to the first equation. And similarly, we can calculate the eigenvectors for minus 5 and 6. How should you maintain your deployed model? Ooh, distribution time, my favorite. Uh, I spent 10 years in software distribution. So first thing, and this is true not just of your data science model, but of any computer code going out there. This is basic setup can work, although usually there's a little added steps in there. First, we're going to monitor it. So we have a constant monitoring of all the model is needed to determine the performance accuracy of the models. So yeah, we want to just keep an eye on it. We want to make sure they're accurate. We want to make sure that whatever they're supposed to predict, or I threw in that bonus word, postscript, where you change something and you want to figure out how your changes are going to affect things, we need to monitor it and make sure it's doing what it's supposed to do. Evaluation metrics of the current model is calculated to determine if new algorithm is needed. And then we compare it. The new models are compared against each other to determine which model performs the best. And then we do a rebuild. The best performing model is rebuilt on the current state of data. And this is interesting. I found this out just recently. If you're in weather prediction, the really big weather areas have about seven or eight different models depending on what's going on. And so you actually have almost a, a little forest going on there where they're like which model is going to fit best and this is what we're going to use to predict the weather with. So not only do you, you don't necessarily get rid of the models but you figure out which models fit data of what's going on or the current state of data. What are recommender systems? Most commonly used nowadays in marketing, so a very big industry understanding recommender systems, predicts the rating or preference a user would give to a product. And they, they're split into two different areas. One is collaborative filtering. And a good example of that is the last.fm recommends tracks that are often played by other users with similar interests. So people who, if you're on Amazon, people who bought this also bought that. This got me a few times. And then there's content-based filtering. And we're looking at content instead of looking at who else is listening to the music. And these example Pandora, which uses the properties of a song to recommend music with similar properties. So you have collaborative filtering and content-based filtering. How to find RMSE and MSE in linear regression model. Hopefully you remember what the two acronyms mean, because that is like half the answer. We have the root mean square error and the mean square error in linear regression model. So we're looking for error. And the RMSE and the MSE are the two of the most common measures of accuracy for a linear regression model. And you can see here we have the root mean square error, RMSE equals, and this is the square root of the sum of the predicted minus the actual squared over the total number. Uh, so we're just looking for the average mean. So we're looking for the average over the end. And the reason you need to know about the difference between RMSE versus MSE is when you're doing a lot of these models and you're building your own model, why do you need to take the square root of it? It doesn't change the value as far as the way you're using it because you're looking as to see whether the error is greater or less than. So why add that extra computation in? So a lot of models use the MSE, which indicates the mean square error or the average error. And it's the same formula minus the square root at the end or across the whole thing. Oh, another uh, riddle to solve. If it rains on Saturday with a probability of 0.6 and it rains on Sunday with a probability 0.2, what is the probability that it rains this weekend? And the trick in probabilities on this case is we're not, we need to know what is the probability of it not raining. What is it not, what's the chance of it not raining on Saturday? And if it doesn't rain on Saturday, we want to take that and combine that with the chance of it not raining on Sunday. The total probability, which in this case we're just going to use 1, minus the probability that it will not rain on Saturday. So that's 1 minus 0.6. We're going to take that as a union, which we simply just multiply them together, of the probability that it will not rain on Sunday. And it's important to recognize the union here, or the, uh, and you can see by the formula down here, we end up with 0.68 or 68% chance that it will rain on the weekend. And there are a couple other ways to solve this, but this is probably the most traditional way of doing that. How can you select K for K-means? 
So first you better understand that what k means is and that k is the number of different groupings. And most commonly we use is the elbow method to select k for k means. The idea of the elbow method is to run k means clustering on the data set where k is the number of clusters. Within the sum of squares, WSS is defined as the sum of the squared distance between each member of the cluster and its centroid. And you should know all the terms for your k-means on there. And with the elbow point, and again, here's our iteration in our code. We talked about that earlier. You iterate starting with, um, usually you don't start right at 1, but uh, you might start with 2, 3, or 4. And you just see where it comes out, and you can see the nice elbow there, which is easy to see graphically, where the number of k clusters and the WSS value drops. And then it just kind of flattens out, and there's no reason to take the k-means any further. What is the significance of p-value? Oh, good one. Especially if you're dealing with r, because that's the first thing that pops up. p-value typically less than or equal to 0.05 indicates a strong evidence against the null hypothesis. And you should know what a difference, why we use null hypothesis instead of the hypothesis. So you reject the null hypothesis. Very important, that term null hypothesis in any scientific setup and also in data science. It doesn't mean that it's true. It means that there's a high correlation that it's true. So if your null hypothesis means it's not true, your hypothesis is has a high correlation that it's probably true. And if the p-value is typically greater than 0.05, it indicates a weak evidence against the null hypothesis. So you fail to reject the whole null hypothesis, and if you reject that, then your actual hypothesis is probably not true the correlation of your data with what you think it's saying is, is probably incorrect. And if you're right at the cutoff of 0.05, it's considered to be marginal. Could go either way. And again, you can use that p-value on different features to decide whether you're going to include your features as far as something worth exploring in your data science model. How can outlier values be treated? Ooh, good one. You can drop outliers only if it is a garbage value. So sometimes you end up with like one outlier that just is probably someone's measurements way off. Height of an adult equals ABC feet. This cannot be true as height cannot be a string value. In this case, outliers can be removed. If the outliers have extreme values, they can be removed. For example, if all the data points are clustered between 0 to 10, but one point lies at 100, then we can remove this point. And again, sometimes you just look for the outliers so you can see what's going on, if there's something unusual there. So maybe the equipment's not calibrated correctly. If you cannot drop outliers, you can try the following. Try a different model. Data detected as outliers by linear model can be fit by nonlinear model. So we be sure you are choosing the right model. So if it has like more of a curved look to it instead of a straight line, you might need to use something other than just a straight line linear model. Try normalizing the data. This way the extreme data points are pulled to a similar range. If you can use algorithms which are less affected by outliers, example random forest. So there is another solution is you can come up with the random forest which a lot of times completely bypasses your outliers. How can you say that a time series data is stationary? Oh, that's an interesting term. Stationary, meaning it's not moving, but it's a time series. We can say that a time series is stationary when the variance and mean of the series is constant with time. And this the graphic example is very easy to see. We have our, um, the variance is constant with time. So we have our first variable, y and x, and x being the time factor, and y being the variable. As you can see, goes through the same values all the time. It's not changing in the long period of time. So that's stationary. And then you can see in the second example, the waves get bigger and bigger, so that's non-stationary. Here the variance is changing with time. Again, we have y, which stays constant, so that if you look at the bigger picture, it's the same wave over and over again. And then, of course, we have uh, where the wave is growing in size going up. It can also go down, so it'd also be non-stationary. How can you calculate accuracy using confusion matrix? Oh, great one. Uh, confusion matrices are so useful when you're taking that first look at data and also when you're showing the shareholders and you want to ask them for money. How can you calculate accuracy using confusion matrix? So you have your total data that we're looking at is 650, and you have your predicted values and your actual values, and you have your predicted P and your actual P. And so when we look at this, you'll note that if the predicted P and the actual P are 262, but our predicted P also had 15 that weren't correct. So you can see there's a false positive there of 15. And the same thing with the N. You can see where N predicts N, and it has a false negative of 26 out of the total number of N values in there. And so we can do an accuracy on there. The true positive plus the true negative is our total observations. So you have a total of 0.93 accuracy, or 93%. 
And just a quick note on this, this is so important because it's one thing if someone is being diagnosed with, uh, say, cancer, you know, this is life death, or is my nuclear reactor going to blow up? Suddenly, if the P is the probability of it blowing up, and this can say you have 15, that's a lot less than, say, the 26 chances of it blowing up. You know, so the actual domain of your data is very important. So if you're non-positive, you don't really care about the predicted value having non-positive as positive because they're going to go do a biopsy on the cancer or whatever anyway. But you're very interested if you have a positive, um, an actual positive value, which is looked at as negative, a false negative. That's really important in that domain, depending on what domain you're in. Write the equation and calculate precision and recall rate. And so continuing with our um, confusion matrix, I was just talking about the different domains. We have the precision equals 262 over 277. So your precision is the true positive over the true positive fa plus false positive. And the recall rate is your true positive over the total positive plus false negative. And you can see here we have that 262 over uh, 277 equals a 94%. And the recall over here is the 262 over 2 80, which equals 9.9 or 90 percent. And oh good, we're going to take a pause for another brain teaser. If a drawer contains 12 red socks, 16 blue socks, and 20 white socks, how many must pull out to be sure of having a matching pair? The last time I went through these kind of brain teaser things was like 20 years ago, and I had six people sitting across the table waiting for my answer. That's kind of mind-numbing when you're in an interview like that. Hopefully you're not stuck in an interview like that. But uh, on this, you need to ask yourself, how many different colors of socks are there? So they've thrown a lot of extra data in here that you don't need to solve the answer. The answer is four. An example, your first pick is white, your second pick is red, third pick is blue, so no pairs yet. And that means when you get to the fourth pick, there's a 100% chance you're going to have a match. So the most is going to be four that you ever have to pull out of your drawer. If it was four colors, the answer would be five, and so on. It doesn't matter how many white socks you have or how many red socks or blue socks, different pairs you have. It's the different colors, the number of different colors. People who bought this also bought recommendations seen on Amazon as a result of which algorithm? Ooh, we covered this earlier. Recommendation engine is done with collaborative filtering. Collaborative filtering exploits the behavior of other users and their purchase history in terms of ratings, selection, etc. It makes predictions on what you might interest a person based on the preference of many other users. And this algorithm, features of the items are not known. And we have a nice example here where they took a snapshot of a sales page. It says, uh, for example, suppose X number of people buy a new phone and then also buy tempered glass with it. Next time when a person buys a phone, he'll be recommended to buy tempered glass along with it. And if you remember the um, vocabulary words we covered earlier, this is the recommendation. This is collaborative. The other word was content-based. So looking at things with similar content versus collaborative, which is similar people. And remember, you know, you're not going to know every vocabulary word, but it also doesn't hurt to get your 3x5 cards out and make yourself a vocabulary stack of cards. Buy an app on your phone for it. SQL query. I remember back in the 90s, it was so important to know SQL query and only a few people got it. Nowadays, it's just part of your kit. You have to know some basic SQL. So write a basic SQL query to list all orders with customer information. And you can kind of make up your own name for the database. And you can pause it here if you want to write that down on a paper. And let's go ahead and look at this. We have uh, to list all orders with customer information. And so usually you have an order table and a customer table. And you have an order ID, a customer ID, order number, total amount. And then from your customer table, you have ID, first name, last name, city, county. And so if we're going to write in SQL with this, we're going to select keyword there for SQL, selecting order number, total amount, first name, last name, city, country. So that's the columns we're going to look at. We're going to do that from our order, where we're going to join it with our customer, and we're going to join it on the order customer ID equals the customer ID. So very basic SQL query that's going to return a table of data for us. You are given a data set on cancer detection. You've built a classification model and achieved an accuracy of 96%. Woo, 96%. Why shouldn't you be happy with your model? performance. What can you do about it? That's an interesting one because this comes up. That's one of the standard data sets on there is for cancer detection. Cancer detection results in imbalanced data. 
In an imbalanced data set, accuracy should not be based as a measure of performance because it is important to focus on the remaining 4%, which are the people who were wrongly diagnosed. We talked a little bit about this earlier. You have to know your domain. You know, this is the medical cancer domain versus weather domain. You know, weather channel, they can get by with 50% wrong. In cancer, you don't want 4% of the people being wrongly diagnosed. Wrong diagnosis is of a major concern because there can be people who have cancer but were not predicted so. In an imbalanced data set, accuracy should not be used as a measurement performance. Which of the following machine learning algorithm can be used for inputting missing values of both categorical and continuous variables? And so we have a couple choices here. We have k-means clustering. We have linear regression. We have the k-n-n, nearest neighbor, and decision tree. And which of the following machine learning algorithms can be used for inputting missing values of both categorical and continuous variables? Now, certainly you can use some pre-processing to do some of that, but you should have gone with the k nearest neighbor because it can compute the nearest neighbor and if it doesn't have the value it just computes the nearest neighbor based on all the other features where when you're dealing with k-means clustering or linear regression you need to do that in your pre-processing otherwise it'll crash decision trees also although there's some variance on that too can you solve another riddle always fun ones given a box of matches and two ropes not necessarily identical measure a period of 40 five minutes. And in this particular setup, the ropes are not uniform in nature, and the rope takes exactly 60 minutes to completely burn out. So each rope takes up to 60 minutes to burn out. And there's actually a couple different solutions to this. But let me go ahead. And one of the things is they're not uniform in nature. So even though they take 60 minutes... Anyways, let's go ahead and see what they did to solve it. And then we can also look at different options. We have two ropes, A and B. Light A from both ends and B from one end. Okay. When A is finished burning, we know that 30 minutes have elapsed and B has 30 minutes remaining. Now light the other end of B also so that the remaining part of B will burn, taking 15 minutes to burn. This we have gotten 30 plus 15 equals 45 minutes. Excellent solution. Mine, <laughs> which I like, <laughs> was to take one rope, fold it in two, so we know it's a half hour. Take the other rope, fold it in four places, so we know that that one's 15 minutes, and then you can just connect the two and burn it straight across. I think they're trying to, to cover that by saying they're not regular. The ropes are, have some irregularities. Maybe that's what they meant by that, is you couldn't do something like that. But that's my solution. Below are the eight actual values of target variable in the train file. So we have a training file, not to be confused with the train on the tracks. We have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. What is the entropy of the target variable? We mentioned earlier that you should know your entropy and how to calculate the entropy. What is the entropy of the target variable? So we have a couple options here. We have minus 5 over 8, logarithm of 5 over 8, plus 3 over 8, logarithm of 3 over 8. Okay, let's just see where they got those numbers from. We have uh, 1, which is going to be 5 1s and 3 zeros, and then we have a total of 8. Okay, and then we have the option of 5 uh, which is the number of ones, 5 8 logarithm of 5 8 plus 3 8 logarithm of 3 8 and we also have 3 8 logarithm of 5 8 plus 5 8 logarithm of 3 8 and then we kind of reverse those numbers around. And let's see what you're going to get here. Which one did you think it was? You should have checked the first one. So what is the entropy of the target variable? The key there is the target variable. So we're looking at the target in this case is going to be 1. Usually that's what you're looking for. And so the entropy of that one, we want to subtract out the entropy of the non-target variable. Whoops, I had that backwards. We want to, we're looking at 0, so we want to subtract out the 5 8s from there. So 5 8s logarithm 5 8s, or negative 5 8s logarithm 5 8s plus 3 8s logarithm 3 8s. And they have the hint on the bottom, entropy equals I of P of N. So we have a negative P plus P and N times the logarithm base 2 of P over P plus N minus the N over P plus N times the logarithm 2 of N over P plus N. We want to predict the probability of death from heart disease based on three risk factors, age, gender, and blood cholesterol level. What is the most appropriate algorithm for this case? So we have three features, and we want to know the predictability of death. Okay, a little morbid there. Choose the right algorithm. Do we want to use logistic regression for this? Linear regression? K 
k-means clustering or the Aproria algorithm. And if you selected logistic regression, then you probably got the right answer. Linear regression, remember, deals with like uh, you take your line and draw a line through the data. And of course, you don't necessarily have to use a straight line. There's other means for that. But you're dealing with a lot of numbers. And k-means means we're just going to cluster objects together. With the logistic regression, though, you can mix those things together in buckets. So really, the logistic regression is what you want to use in that model, would be the most apt fit. After studying the behavior of a population, you have identified four specific individual types who are valuable to your study. You would like to find all users who are most similar to each individual type. Which algorithm is most appropriate for this study? Certainly, identifying census in just about a lot of different markets is common, so maybe they have a census or whatever it means. But let's take a look at some of the different algorithms we might use on this. We have k-means clustering, linear regression, association rules, and decision trees. And uh, I'll give you a hint. We're looking for grouping people together by similarities and uh, by four different similarities, so very specific. They gave you one of the values, specifically the k value. So k means clustering would be great for this particular problem. You have run the association rules algorithm on your data set. And the two rules, banana apple is uh, associated with grape and apple orange is associated with grape have been found to be relevant. What else must be true? So this is a challenge you to understand association rules. You could picture in this particular one, you're going shopping and uh, you almost always see somebody who has bananas, they usually have grapes in their bag also. And somebody who has apples usually has grapes in their bags. And then apples and oranges is also associated with grapes. And let's go ahead and take a look at that. And we have a couple different options here. First one is banana, apple, and grape, orange must be a frequent item set. Not so much. Banana, apples, oranges must be relevant rule. Grape is common with banana, apple, must be a relevant rule. And how about grape, apple, must be a frequent item set. Let's go back and take a look at that. And we notice that we have bananas, apples to grapes. We have apple, orange to grape. Boy, there's a lot of grapes and a lot of apples in there. And so if you said the last one, grape and apple must be a frequent item set, then you got it correct. Your organization has a website where visitors randomly receive one of two coupons. It is also possible that visitors to the website will not receive a coupon. You have been asked to determine if offering a coupon to visitors to your website has any impact on their purchase decision. Which analysis method should you use? And so let's go ahead and start by giving you uh, another hint and give you some uh, limiting your selection. We have a one-way ANOVA. K means clustering, association rules, and student t-test. So obviously you should know what each one of these means, but let's take a look at the question again. Uh, so you want to know which method should you use to see if the coupon's valid for their purchase. Well, we're not clustering and we're not associating things together. We want to know the end result. Student t-test also drawing that little t in boxes and switching them around. There's really only one answer that works in here, and that's the one-way ANOVA. So that draws us to an end. I want to thank you for joining us today. For more information, visit www.simplylearn.com. Get certified. Get ahead. Feel free to visit our website and ask any additional questions you have. You can also post questions down below in the YouTube video, and we'll try to get the, one of our experts will try to reach out to you and answer those questions. Again, thank you for joining us, and happy learning. And since these are interview questions, good luck on your next interview. Or if you're the interviewer looking for questions to ask people, good luck on your next interview. Hi there. If you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.